Greetings and salutations. This is the 90 Degree Director Series for 2014 featuring Dr. Kevin O. Davenport. Hosted by the Marching Podcast and sponsored by Block Band Music and Publishing. And now, without further ado, 2014 Director's Podcast Series, you may now take the field. Hello, greetings, and we thank God for everything that he's done for us, and we welcome you to the 2014 90 Degree Director Series. We are just tickled, and we are so excited to have this um, series for you and for all our wonderful listeners out there. Today is May 18th, 2014, 3.30 on the West Coast and 12.30 on the West Coast. Um, this is a little something different um, from our normal 90-degree show because this is more geared for the directors and preparing our youth for outstanding competitions, outstanding um, development of characters, and so what and so forth. But we're excited here because we're going to be somewhat combining all of our shows and uh, putting everything together for everyone to uh, just, uh, continue to the um, conversation throughout the year. We know the 90 Degree Show usually is more geared towards the battles and, of course, it's, oh, this person was better or this band was better. But now we are all going to sit at the table and join together at one and break bread together and learn how to build each other. Um, so I can continue to talk. I'm more excited than the script that I even wrote because it's, uh, I know this is going to be a good show. We actually had a lot of green room conversations about this, and this has been in the, in the making for a couple months now. But uh, without further ado, let me bring in our outstanding guest uh, for the evening and our expertise that will be bringing us all this great information, Dr. Kevin O. Davenport. How are you doing this afternoon, sir? All right. I'm excited about this opportunity to talk. I am too, man. To I, I, and uh, I just want to say thank you for doing this. Thank you for your time. It's been great to touch base and get to know you um, more and more. And I swear, I, I swear, I could just sit and talk. But you know, me and you, Rashad, we're gonna try to work out this format so it's on point because I think we could probably stay on the air for a couple of hours just talking. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But it's 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 really great to have you. Um, in this first section, I wanted to introduce everyone. I'm going to go ahead and bring um, our wonderful owner uh, and uh, the man that makes it all happen for Block Band Music and Publishing, the man, the one and only Mr. Rashad Waters. What's going on, Rashad? What's happening? What's happening? I'm glad you uh, – um, I'm glad I got some um, – what is it, type of setup there because I was sitting here microwaving uh, uh, for you to <laughs> – <laughs> I didn't want to have that uh, on the air, you know. Saying that's not really the secret to band competitions is having a fajita ready. But uh, we're doing good, man. <laughs> yeah, and and Rashad is always the one, you know. You're a busy man, but um, we we always catch you in the middle of something. Well, you know, washing dishes or getting gas. It definitely adds to the value of the show because Rashad is in the streets. You know what I'm saying? All all times. <laughs> Um, so, man, I really appreciate uh, the friendship, really appreciate the partnership. Well, Block Band Music is an outstanding company, and we're excited to have Block Band Music sponsor this um, outstanding show. I want to welcome all the listeners and say hello to you again. You are welcome to call in tonight at 718-664-6025. I'll give you guys just a little format somewhat. We will be talking in three different blocks tonight. Uh, we're going to try to keep this format even with the 90 degree show in the fall. You know, I get so excited. I say this over and over. I get so excited about when we get calls and I get into the conversation. I really need to, need to pay attention to the clock. Uh, so what we're going to do tonight's show is about preparing for competitions. Uh, Dr. Davenport will be schooling us uh, in lecture 
and we'll be asking questions and whatnot. Um, but then we'll start to bring in more of the questions in the latter part of the program. We want to make sure that Dr. Davenport gets his information out about there, and we want to make sure that we don't want to take too much time with uh, directing calls. So if you're in the call queue and we see a couple people out there now, we're not going to take those calls just yet until we open up more of the call lines for a discussion. We're going to let uh, Dr. Davenport lecture us again, and uh, Rashad as well. Rashad is even with his outstanding um, company, uh, sending out so many publishers. I, I'm part of a little group there with Block Band on my phone, and just to say, just to see all of the work that you're doing and all of the, the songs that you're putting out there. So we got that outstanding music education here for the Marching Podcast for you guys to listen to. And uh, again, like we'll open more of the uh, user-defined questions towards the end of the show. So right now, I want to go ahead and get our first commercial block out of the way to say hello to our beloved sponsors. Again, this show is sponsored by Block Band Music, but we also have our contributors to the network that help build and support the Martian Podcast. You'll hear from them as well. Just not as much as block band music since they're paying all the bills. So, again, thanks for all of those who are listening live, listening in podcast form, uh, whether through iTunes, uh, Blog Talk Radio, Facebook, Twitter, any type of social media. We're just really excited to have you on here. And shouts out to all the people that. Uh, got the ticket from Block Band, or I'm sorry, not Block Band, from the uh, fifth quarter. We know we want to say hello and praise our beloved Holy Grail of internet uh, smack talk and uh, keeping our ear to the street with the fifth quarter. And I know Rashad did outstanding work with uh, marketing um, today's show there. So shouts out to you if you hit that link or if you knew about the show from the fifth quarter. Now let's go ahead and get into it. Tonight's show is brought to you by Block Band Music, bandhead.org, and uh, Black, Block Band Music, bandhead.org, and Liquid Effects Photography and Block Band Music. Um, and uh, li <laughs> I need to get all these companies together. And the Marching Podcast as well. So thank you and sit back and let's go ahead and have a good time this evening. Again, you're welcome to call in, but we'll take those calls towards the latter part of the program. Now let's hear from our beloved sponsors before we get right into it. Hello. This is Charles Cheese Waters, proud graduate of Rust College in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and father of the owner of Block Band Music and Publishing. And you're listening to the 90 Degrees Show on the Marching Podcast Network. Need to write music and drill? Get it on the field. I'll fix your band, keep your administrator happy, and still have a life. Encountering drama in the process, ain't nobody got time for that. Let Block Band Music assist you with musical arrangements and drills to fix your band. And also the equipment, gear, and accessories to keep the visuals, music, and marching on point. Contact BlockBandMusic at gmail.com and see how this worldwide minority-owned business can uplift your band. What if there was a Facebook for bands? Wait a minute, there is. Bandhead.org. Bandhead.org is a social network for HBCU show bands. You can create your own profile and post videos, photos, and comments on Bandhead.org. Need somewhere to post events, audition schedules, job postings? Check out Bandhead.org. Are you recruiting for talent? Go to Bandhead.org. Bandhead.org, a social network for bands. Chopping It Up is a podcast of one-on-one -on -one interviews with positive role models that have a connection through music and or education. Chopping It Up is all about inspiring our youth for a great future and providing a roadmap on how to get there. We also chop it up to give insight to anyone looking for information or hope in their endeavors. Chop it up with us on Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern at blogtalkradio.com slash marching podcast. Chopping it up, changing the world through positive interaction. 
Having an anniversary party, birthday party, or better yet, you're about to marry that special someone? Liquid Effects Photography is the perfect choice to immortalize all your most special moments. With 10 years of dependable professional service that can deliver from the conventional to the best in cutting edge technology and creativity. Come experience the uniqueness of Liquid Effects Photography. We serve the entire upper Midwest and will travel further upon request. Come check us out at liquideffects.com. That's L I Q U I D E F F E X.com. Or call us at 773 454 5556. That's 773 454 5556. Hey, this is John Pickens, CEO and founder of Simply Dope Creative, and you're listening to the 90 Degree Show here on the Marching Podcast Network. Okay, we're back, and we want to say thanks again to our beloved sponsors. We're going to go ahead and uh, bring Dr. Davenport back in. We want to let the uh, listeners or inform the listeners of your expertise and um, um, all the things that you've done in your wonderful career, Dr. Davenport. So I just want to ask you a couple questions just so people could and we could introduce you a little bit to the crowd a little bit. We're more than likely be having a chopping it up show which will be a little bit different than the other ones because I know we're going to get some information out about about you now but um, you and I have got a couple stories we definitely have to tell the public so we'll definitely be hitting that uh, across the airwaves soon um, but just getting right into it Dr. Davenport where are you from? I'm originally from Portsmouth, Virginia Oh wow uh, okay to, Yeah went to I.C. Norcom High School myself Alright now were you in the band uh, there when you were in high school there? Oh, yeah, that's where I actually started my musical career in the band at, at I.C. Norcom. Okay. Well, what uh, what did you play? Tuba player. Actually, I oh. actually originally started as a French horn player and moved to tuba because we didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. You're already fi- filling the gaps. We're needed already from a young age. So that's, gotta, that's outstanding. Gotta do what you got to do. Absolutely. That's all right. That's all right. So now... So as far as you were Virginia, you definitely had, I'm sure, the show band, black college experience type. Are, is your family all from the Virginia area? Yes. My okay. family is from, from Portsmouth, Virginia as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So where, how far, as far as, I guess, uh, geographically, where is that in relation to, like, Hampton and Norfolk? Portsmouth actually borders Norfolk. It's one one tunnel that separates the two. Um, it's wrapped around the other side by Chesapeake, so you get Portsmouth, Norfolk, Chesapeake, all those right there in the same area together, across the Bay Bridge from Hampton. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so you had that experience then, I guess, at a young age. Did you see show-style bands, I guess, before you were even in high school? Well, the, the, you know, the interesting thing is band in that area was, was life. I mean, it was a full-blown culture of marching band down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the great Emory Sears actually was a band director at Northam High School way before I went to high school. Um, so we grew up with band being as important in school as any of the athletics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every band, every school in the area had a very good band program. Um, both marching and concert. So that's the culture that I grew up in. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I always like to talk to folks down south and get that experience because, you know, I, I didn't have that experience. St. Louis was not band friendly. You know, was, you know, if you were in a band, you know, you were a little off or whatever. Or it's just, just the level of competition not um, paid as much attention to as sports, just like you said. But, you know, down south, that's, that's a whole lot different, you know. Um, love to hear that. Love to hear that. So, what college did you end up deciding to go to? I went uh, to Tennessee State University on scholarship. Um, interestingly enough, I had uh, two months before I went to Tennessee State. I had never heard of Tennessee State. Um, my <laughs> uh, <laughs> my high school band director was a drum major at Shaw University under Professor Edward Graves. And Professor Graves left Shaw and went to Tennessee State. And my high school band director, of course, uh, had that relationship with him. And he began to come to Portsmouth and Norfolk and recruit uh, us out of that area for the first time to go to Tennessee State University. He actually picked up about 35 students from Norfolk and Portsmouth all at the same time. Mm. And uh, we all went there together. And great experience. So did were, were you... 
did you prefer that you wanted to go away from home? Um, did you ever think that you wanted to go to either Norfolk or Hampton just because it was so close? You know, I, I, I never really gave either of them a lot of thought. Um, <laughs> okay. In, in high school, one thing our band director did was he took us to different colleges different area, in different areas, um, kind of away from that area of Virginia. So we had a lot of exposure seeing other colleges. Uh, so going away to go, go to go to school to be in a band, it, it seemed like a natural part of <laughs> of life, like I said, because we had been okay. exposed to so much. Uh, I can tell you, I probably wouldn't have gone to college if I had not been in a band, because that was my first exposure to HBCUs, is by going and playing at people's homecomings and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely very similar to me. Um, just you know, having that exposure. My dad went to Jackson State, so it was just really important that you know he gave me that exposure to seeing the bands. And yeah, I definitely I knew I was going to college, but I wasn't really tripping about academics. You know, I was like, man, I'm going to march in this band. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, as far as youth catching up with it, that it actually evens itself out. So that's actually outstanding. Um, you went to Tennessee State. Did you know that you were going to be a band director? I, I think I knew from my sophomore year in high school. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a program where we were being taught how to arrange music, and I, and I was personally being taught how to design drill from the 10th grade. And it was the first time really in my life that I started doing something that I knew that I enjoyed doing and had the gift to do. Mm -hmm. Um, The youngest of five kids and my two brothers were both star athletes. Oh, wow. I I never saw myself as as a star athlete. So it was a chance for me to kind of go off in my own way. Um, And I loved it so much and it meant so much to me in high school. I wanted to pursue it myself, uh, be a band director, follow my band director's footsteps. Um, the great thing is I had a chance to be under my high school band director also in college because two years after I went to college, he actually came to Tennessee State as an assistant band director. Wow, okay. So, yeah, so it was, a, it, you know, it was that continuity was very, very important. That's real interesting. That's very interesting you say, you know, that continuity was so, cuz it seemed like it, you know, it continued to work out for you. Um when you finished Tennessee State, where cuz you were Dr. Davenport, of course. Uh not, where not, did not you, originally. Or, okay. <laughs> I left, <laughs> That's yeah, right. I left Tennessee State with a bachelor's degree. Yeah, so and, where did you uh, leave after that? I ended up going back to Portsmouth. Um I was hired specifically to take over IC Norcom High School. I was 21 years old at the time. Wow. (laughs) So I had a chance to go back and become band director at my high school immediately after coming out of college. Were you nervous? No. And and (laughs) uh, I, I... my experience at Tennessee State was, was one that really prepared me for what I was going to do. Um, okay. I designed shows for Tennessee State while I was still in undergrad. Um, and at Tennessee State, the students were allowed to be uh, busy in every part of the program. So it was like a lab for us that were that were music majors. We had a, really had a chance to really get hands-on and uh, doing things, you know, Everything from lining a field, and like I said, I designed shows for three years, um, getting in the instrument and uniform inventory and learning how to do that. Um, I didn't do much arranging at Tennessee State. Like I said, I learned in high school, uh, but I spent most of my time in drill design. But I was also head drum major at Tennessee State, so the leadership aspect at the wow. uh So when I came out of college, you know, I had been – truly trained in every, just about every aspect of what I needed to start a pro, really get the program going. Um, probably the hardest part was dealing with parents. That was, <laughs> that was <laughs> I had to learn, had to learn on the fly. So. Oh, that's great. And, and, it's, and it's good that the listener gets to hear that. So it's like you said, you've been pretty much, you've had experience 
along with your age, you know, up until that, you know, you were 21 years old. So, um, I mean, um, and, you know, and we talked about that nervousness, too, you know, a little bit. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. It just sounds like it's a part of you. You know what I mean? Well, you you know, prepared. Another thing that I really had the advantage of is coming from the high school that I went to. So I was really only gone four years. Uh, so when I went back, a lot of the teachers were my teachers from high school. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I knew the administration and knew the teachers when I went back, which was a big advantage. You know, I didn't have to get to know them, and I had, you know, some credibility with them already built up from having gone to school there. And that was a very unique situation. Who gets the chance to go back to their alma mater and become a band director? That's a rare thing. Mm-hmm. Um of course, I had a chance to do that with high school and college. So that's outstanding. So, so we're getting somewhat towards the end because I, 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 I want because um, you actually we actually we put a a really good stopping point there. You went back to your high school at twenty one. How long were you there at your high school? I taught there for ten years. Wow. Okay. So you were then in your thirties then, and what? Did you then go to graduate school after that, or were you working during that time? Well, I was um, working full-time at Norcom, um, and I was also going to uh, Hampton for grad school. Ah, okay, Um, okay. Mr. Barney Smart, rest his soul, was a great friend, and he'd come over to recruit my students out of Norcom, and liked what he saw and offered me a fellowship to go to Hampton for grad school. So, wow. Yeah, that was a, a real blessing. So I was able yeah. to get my master's degree while I was still teaching high school. And I'd leave out of my band rehearsal and run over to Hampton's rehearsals. Right, right. And, uh, that was such a good, I mean, that was a set of grad assistants over there that was just unbelievable. Um, and we talked like, about oh, that. Could you, yeah, could you give us some of those names? Because I know, I mean, that that's huge. I, I really wanted to kind of paint the picture for the listeners. Well, the people that were in grad school at the same time was it was myself, it was Carlton Wright, who's uh, the current band director at Alabama A&M, uh-huh. uh, Donovan Wells, who's a platoon cookman, um, Ben McKnight, who was the arranger at South Carolina State. He's actually up here in Maryland now. Um, Barrett Alexander, who's a band director down in Atlanta, Georgia, at this point. And um, we all became very good friends. Uh, and... Uh, Barney Smart surrounded himself with some, some real talent, unbelievable mm-hmm. talent, and um, gave us assignments, and we we worked the program, uh, and it, it was a, a that was a learning experience as well, uh, being around those guys and seeing their talents and learning from what they did when we shared philosophy and just spent a lot of time together. Yeah, and that and that's huge. I mean, that's still even now it's still like. Gives me chills when you say some of those names and the fact that you guys were like in school together, like you were peers. You know what I'm saying? Like you now have elevated to your echelons of your career now, but the fact you guys were all together, y'all were like the Fab Five in Michigan or something, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we had so, we, we had we had a, we had a good time with each other. It was a good, yeah. It was a really good time. That's outstanding. I mean, that's just unbelievable, you know, just just to hear those names that you guys were growing together. It really shows. Um, so so then you then received your master's degree. Did you know then you wanted to go get your Ph.D.? Well, I knew eventually I would get my um, get my doctorate. Um, someone had spoken that on me, um, Professor Edward Graves, had told me, he was the first person told me, you need to get your doctorate. And um, I took that to heart. Um, I got an EDS, an educational specialist degree, uh, from Tennessee State uh, while I was associate band director there. And I actually just finished my doctorate in 2010. Okay. So I continue to move forward in education. Definitely, definitely. And you're definitely doing great things now. Um um, and, and we're going to go to our commercial break. We're going to bring in Rashad. We're going to get into the meat of our topic tonight. Um, but but you also now, you have a website. 
you have a book. You are basically, you know, not only in this podcast, you are basically um, helping other people advance themselves through band, helping directors. Seems like this is like your passion. Can you just give us uh, all, uh, your information about your website? Uh, where can we can get your book uh, before we start to get into the expertise? Okay. Well, uh, my website is uh, Dr. K. Davenport. Um, and it's on the Wix site, so it's Dr. K. Davenport slash uh, dot Wix dot com slash my site, and it gives information, biographical information, information about my book, uh, Practical Techniques for Building the High School Marching Band, which is currently being used at three universities as required reading in music education courses. Um, and... The website gives all the information about um kind of training I do. I'm actually trying to get into the band program consulting business where I go out and look at band programs and help band directors build their programs in a way that they can be sustainable. And wow. that's what I'm that's that's what I want to do with my life now is help band directors build solid programs. Um there seems to be, you know, in, even in the music education courses in college, they're really not giving out information that allows somebody to be successful as a band director. We kind of learn uh, you know, on the fly. It, uh, they give a lot of music music philosophy, but it's not solid, concrete information. So my book is practical things that a new band director needs to think about when they're building their program, and I'm trying to do the same thing through talking to people. Um, my book can be bought um, several places online, uh, but Block Band Music is selling my book, and we have uh, actually worked out a deal that if you buy the book through Block Band, um, a year's consulting comes along with it. So the band director wow. that buys the book from them uh, for a year can pick up a phone and call me and ask me any questions that they want to ask about helping uh, their program be successful. So we hope that's that great. people will go that way to get it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great, man. That's I mean that's that's outstanding. Um shouts out to you, Rashad, you know, for going that. I'm going to um pull up your website and I, I meant to say excuse me for all our listeners if you are listening live and have a blog talk radio account you're welcome to join our chat room it was got a good couple of people already in there uh, in the chat room um, I will post that website I just posted the website your work website to the chat room and um, what's the uh, title of your book I'll go ahead and put it out there for the uh, people in the chat room Practical Techniques for Building the High School Marching Band. And it's under the name K. Owens Davenport ETS. Okay, I just put Practical Techniques for Building the High School Marching Band. Okay, so for all you people out there, if you have a blog, talk, radio, or kind of listening live, we're welcome to join our chat room and leave cha uh, leave your um your comments there as well, and we'll read them on the air. If you have a question uh, and you just shy to go on the air, you can come in through our chat room and do that as well. So um, we really appreciate your time. I wanted to give the listeners a quick, uh, just a resume sample from you, and I definitely wanted to touch base with listeners about, you know, um, your your grad peers. I mean, that's that's like so powerful to me. I still get fuzzy when I hear those names, but just – um, like I said, how those things grow into who you guys are now. And it's just I hope that the young kids, too, you know, the ones that are aspiring to be band directors or the young, great music educators, um, knowing that they want to be band directors and drum majors and what have you, just hearing that you guys had these similar experiences, who knows, the people that are around them now will be will be having these conversations with them in, you know, 15 years or so. Um, so I really appreciate your time. I really wanted uh, to hear that. We're going to go ahead and take another commercial break, a quick commercial break, so you hear from our beloved block band. And we'll be back with Rashad, and we'll get into uh, preparing for the competition. This is the 2014 Director Series with the 90 Degree Show, Block Band Music, and the Marching Podcast.
This is David Thompson, owner and founder of Liquid Effects Photography, and you're listening to the 90 Degree Show here on the Marching Podcast Network. And the Rexes, have you ever found yourselves in this situation? Showtime is quickly approaching. Your budget is quickly disappearing. Your music choices are narrowing. The equipment condition is wearing and your stress level is mounting. Stop what you're doing and contact Block Band Music and find out how we've got you. Check www.blockbandmusic.com. Providing music, equipment, gear, and accessories to show style, core style, and traditional bands worldwide. What if there was a Facebook for bands? Wait a minute, there is. Bandhead.org. Bandhead.org is a social network for HBCU show bands. You can create your own profile and post videos, photos, and comments on Bandhead.org. Need somewhere to post events, audition schedules, job postings? Check out Bandhead.org. Are you recruiting for talent? Go to Bandhead.org. Bandhead.org, a social network for bands. Hello, this is Charles Cheese Waters, proud graduate of Rust College in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and father of the owner of Block Band Music and Publishing. And you're listening to the 90 Degree Show on the Marching Podcast Network. Okay, we're back, and we appreciate all those listening. Uh, we'll bring uh, Dr. Dev, uh, Dr. Davenport back in, but we're also going to bring in the owner and founder of Block Band Music, the one and only uh, Rashad Waters. What's going on, Rashad? Man, I'm I'm doing all right, man. You know, you got my dad on here introducing the show and got his voice on there, man. I feel like I'm in trouble every time I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I stop. I, I gotta, you know, I'm doing whatever I'm doing. And all of a sudden, I just start paying attention. Like, what is he saying? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm good. Well, man, it's great. <laughs> Working with your dad, and man, let me tell you, he's he's really proud of you and all that you're doing. And then I heard, not only is he from Alabama, but your mom was from Mississippi, and he went to Russ College. I said, man, I knew I knew we had a connection somewhere, man. So that, that's all right, man. Russ College. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Yeah, that's that's what he meant. That's cool. That's what's up. Well, we're going going to go ahead and get into uh, preparing for competitions with Dr. Davenport. You're welcome to call in, and like we said, we'll take those calls towards the latter part of the block. And after this block, after our next commercial break, uh, break we'll be opening up more. We'll definitely get into the heart of the matter here now with Dr. Davenport and uh, preparing for competition. So, Dr. Davenport, uh, is there a segue that you can uh, lead us into today about these competitions? Well, one thing that I'm doing a lot of these days is uh, adjudicating band competitions. Um, I am active in the National High Step and Band Competition. Uh, as an adjudicator, um, and I get to watch and observe what's going on with the bands now, and and I really see where we need to refocus on what is going on in our programs and why we're attending competitions. I can tell you on the East Coast that there are so many band competitions that you could attend one every weekend from September to November if you chose to take your program that way. Wow. Uh, so they're prevalent. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities to go to these things. But I think we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing it? Uh, because I think that there's a disconnect there of why we're doing band competitions. So I kind of like to start talking first about the philosophy of what a band competition is supposed to be for. Um, and I see four things that should be coming out of these band competitions. Number one, it's a music education activity. We should be using these opportunities to hone the musicianship of our bands. It gives us to take them outside and in an environment where professionals are listening to our groups as well as our peers uh, to really hone the musicianship level of our groups. Um, you know, a lot of times it in halftime shows, we are more apt to try to aim our shows for entertainment purposes at the crowds. But in competition, we should be aiming our purposes 
at the adjudicators and the scores, and it forces us to focus on those elements of music that we should be focusing on. So that's the first first thing that we need to consider uh, in preparing for competitions is it's a music education activity. Um, secondly, it's an exercise in discipline and precision. It gives us an opportunity to once again clean up and tighten up the movement of our shows, uh, students individually and in squads, whatever way we have our show designed, but to get them to think about the execution of what's going on on the field. Uh, we should be doing that anyway, but it, it forces us to focus a little deeper into what we're doing, knowing that we're going to put this on the field and it's going to be put up against what other bands are doing. So that's the second thing uh, that we need to consider. The third is it should be building towards excellence. If we're going to competitions, especially if we're going to competitions every weekend, our programs should be getting better at what they do on the other side of it. Um, however, I've seen directors that go to competition, they find out what place they're in, but they're never reading the score sheets or listening to the comments. Uh, and that's really where we should be growing from the comments we're getting from adjudicators. Uh, those things should be helping us to make our program better, to lead us towards excellence. Um, we shouldn't be going from competition to competition, and the shows are never getting better. The students are never becoming more mature as musicians and more mature at executing a show. Um, fourth, it should be an opportunity to observe and appreciate what our peers are doing, what the other bands are doing. It gives us a chance to see bands that we may not get an opportunity to see. Uh, a lot of competitions, bands are coming from all over the area and sometimes from out of our immediate area, and we get a chance to see what other people are doing within their shows. And therefore, it kind of broadens our horizon to what can be done on the field. And we should be allowing our students to see these other groups and gauge themselves against what's going on in these other groups and see what things these other groups are doing that we could take in that would make our program better. So we're sharing information, and we should all be growing from it. So... We really have to take a step back and think about why we're going to competition and are we getting those things out of competition that we need to. Uh, thing is, competition. We, we kind of lost. We we kind of lost your your voice a little bit. Are you? Okay, I'm still. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's okay. better. It was okay. it seemed like your okay. voice got distant for a second. Yeah. All right. Um, the second thing is we need to make sure that competitions are not isolated things within our programs. A competition show should show off what you're doing on a regular basis in your show. In other words, we should be putting the same kind of excellence in our regular halftime shows as we do in a competition show. If we do that, our stress level and our workload it's not as heavy the week before competition because all we're simply doing is cleaning up, polishing what we already do, not trying to remake our band in a way that we don't normally run the band. Um, if you have you allow your band to do things one way every week, and then the week of competition, you want to get them to now think about intervals or picking their feet up or playing with proper phrasing or playing in tune, and you haven't been doing that all season, when they get on the field and get in that nervous situation, that pressure, they're going to revert back to what they normally do. <laughs> Bands do not change overnight. Mm -hmm. So you, from the beginning of your school year, from band camp, you need to be teaching those elements that will allow students to be prepared when they go in competition. You can't start teaching that a week before. Um, if if you allow students to be on the field at attention and their feet aren't together the rest of the season, 
when they get in competition, you're going to have students that don't have their feet together. Muscle memory is going to go revert right back to what they're used to doing. So we need to be considering that from the beginning of our season to teach those things properly from a discipline and precision aspect so that they will do it automatically when they get on the competition field. It shouldn't be separated from what we do the rest of the season. You can entertain and be clean, and we need to push that towards our students. Uh, as I say, a preparation begins in band camp. If you know what's going to be judged on the competition field, are you teaching those same things and holding it to the same standard from band camp on? Uh, generally, in competition, there are three areas that are judged. Musicality, uh, drill precision and discipline, and general effect. And those three areas need to be worked on from band camp on. Um, I would really suggest that everybody critically look at those areas every week and not just look at them, but continue to comment to your students on what they need to improve on every week, not just the week before competition. It needs to be a regular part of your program. So, you know, those things we must do in order to improve and truly be ready for competition. Um, planning your show and really a matter of doing certain things, as it says, from planning. We need to spend more time planning our show. So when the execution comes, we know exactly what we want to see on the field. It's about vision. Um, That's that important. Can I? Uh, can I? Uh, um, I, I wanna. <clears throat> I wanna. I wanna tell the listeners something before you get into um, the preparation aspect. Okay. Um, I, 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 I. For all those listening in the chat room, I'm actually um, taking notes and I'm putting uh, your highlighted notes here in our chat room. So the people there can listening or if anyone else is listening and you would like to join the chat room or maybe look at some of these notes that we're taking, please do join the chat, um, join the chat room and um, and we're able, we put the website up there, we put the book title up there and then we put the first four things. I just for the listeners, the uh, you uh, you're preaching the, 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 I guess the first four things that I picked up was uh, teaching the music. Uh, music educational activity. This is a music educational activity. Uh, number two, with this is an exercise in discipline and precision. Um, uh, there is a there is a gentleman Mario Warren that is um, that is in the chat room, and he said, "Preach." He is uh, he's definitely <laughs> he's definitely well, Mario, Mario was one of my students at Tennessee State. Oh, okay, okay, so you know him. Okay, great. That's really and, cool. And I have, I have to give a shout out. Mario Warren is uh, uh, the band director at Whitehaven in Memphis that has won the oh. national several times. Wow, <laughs> so Whitehaven he knows is what I'm famous. talking about. Yeah, Whitehaven is famous. Yeah. I, I know that we've uh, actually been to Whitehaven, going to Memphis. I think they let us use their our practice facilities a couple of times for that game. Um, oh, yeah. But number three was building towards excellence. And number four was uh, observing and appreciating uh, what your peers are doing. Um, another and, thing, know, that, I really want to restress that because not enough of that happens. We get in our little cocoons. Uh, you know, I've even seen bands go as far as having the bands turn their backs as other bands are on the field. <laughs> but we are robbing them of music education opportunities when we do that. Mm. They need to see. The only way your band gets better is by seeing groups better than yours. Wow. That's how you grow. Uh, it's just like a football team. You know, a uh, Division Two football team may be great for Division Two, <laughs> but we know if they went into Division One, they get crushed. Mm -hmm. You know, you get better by seeing those that are better than yourself. So we can't be so isolated or so fragile about our egos that we don't want our groups to see groups that are further along that maturity path. That's really the way to look at it. You've got to see groups more mature than your own. That's the only way you grow. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. Absolutely. 
And and the last thing, right right before you uh, before we continue, I uh, just want to say you you said your preparation begins in band camp, and and I paraphrase this a little bit, but make sure you you want to teach what you want your band to be, and it and it becomes a part of them. And the main thing is that they cannot change who they are the week before the competition. You as the director have to make sure that these tools are the muscle memory, like you said. Um, and 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 I asked you earlier, uh, well, previously about the nerves because I'm just a nervous person. I get nervous, I get nervous so any little thing where people are gonna be looking at me. But you said that preparation eliminates that. Absolutely. Well, and 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 let me say that it does not eliminate the nervousness, but it allows them to overcome it. Okay. Because Even when, when yeah, when you're nervous, you can lose focus. You know that. You get so tied up in the fact that you're nervous that if you're having to think about every little thing that you're going to do, you're going to miss something. Mm-hmm. But if you have developed muscle memory by repetition, by knowing exactly what you're supposed to do and your body knows to do it without you even thinking about it, you can get through even though you're nervous because you've been trained that way. Training oh. is so important. And it can't happen in a week or two. It has right. to be from the beginning. That's outstanding. Okay, so please, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I just want to just reiterate that and just let people know that these notes are in the chat room. So, okay. Um, now, when we really get into planning the show, um, here are things that, as an adjudicator, I can tell you that I see on a regular basis, and I really wish I could run down out the judges' stand some stand sometime and go talk to band directors, and I have done it before. Um, particularly bands that you can see are trying to improve, they're trying to get that next level, and sometimes just some, some small things that they could do to immediately jump to the next level. So a few suggestions on what you have to consider in planning that show. Number one is choosing the right music. You have to choose music that accents the strengths of your band and accents musicality. Many times I'm hearing bands that are playing music that either they're not from a maturity standpoint aren't ready to play or the music wasn't written for their instrumentation. Wow. So what happens is you're trying to play. Well, if it's, if, if your band's not mature enough to play it, they're struggling through it. And you want to hear a band go out of tune real fast, let them have to struggle through a piece. <laughs> they're going to go out of tune real quick. Because they're not thinking about armature and support. They're thinking about just playing the notes. Mm-hmm. So we need to make sure that we're using music that is tailored to what we have individually. Now, there are several ways you can do that. One, if you are a mature writer yourself, an arranger, you arrange yourself. No one knows your, your band better than you do. You know what sections are strong, which ones are weak, which ones need to be supported which ones can curl line by themselves. You know those things. Mm-hmm. So if you're that strong an arranger, you do it yourself. If you're not that strong of an arranger, you need to find someone that can do it properly for you. And, and, and I'll take this opportunity to throw this plug in. Companies like Block Band, who take the time to learn the bands that they are writing music for and have a staff of people that will write music tailored to a particular band, you need to, you know, if if you're not that strong an arranger, you need to be willing to know that and find someone that is strong enough. Because you'll destroy yourself on a competition field playing music that your band simply can't handle. Uh, We learned that in the concert field as well. If you're going to play a concert piece, you better make sure you've got the instrumentation to play it. (laughs) And you better make sure you have a band that's ready to play that great of music. But we also need to do that with Martian music. Don't just play it because it has a melody you like. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sure your band can handle it. Um, and so many of the soul and funk pieces have so many individual parts in them. You know, you got to make sure that your sections are strong enough to carry all those lines. Mm-hmm. And that's a matter of training, a matter of educating students so that they can be ready to handle that kind of music. So that's that's the, the, the I gotta stress the point again. Play music that's right to show off the strengths of your group. 
Um, next, um, you got to be careful where you place your instruments. I, this is a personal preference, but I'm going to tell you the preference, and I'm going to tell you why I don't particularly like it. You have to be extremely careful of doing shows downfield, coming from the end zone, in competition. Why? When you line up in the end zone and you start playing, where's your sound going? To the end zone. Out the other, out the other end zone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, if you've got a judge up there that's listening for what you sound like, guess what they're not hearing? Uh-huh. A true representation of what you sound like. <laughs> So <laughs> you line up and you march down the field and you've got a judge already scoring. And they may hear a little bit of this, a little bit of that. One thing they hear too much of is drums normally if they're going on the end zone because now you've got your bass drums uh, heads facing the sideline while mm. all your instruments are facing downfield. So you go out of balance. As well as where you place your instruments, if all your trumpets are on the front, sideline and all your tubers are on the back where you're out of balance as well. So you have to be careful of coming down field playing while you're being judged. The second thing you, reason you want to be careful of that is <laughs> what's the quickest way to know that a line is not straight? To see if I'm oh, the line at different times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've exposed your crooked lines immediately. You know, so you know, we're cr- pretty lines aren't cool. So you want to be, you don't want to expose your band to that kind of adjudication if they don't know how to keep a line. It's very impressive if you can do it. But if your lines are going to be crooked, don't come downfield. That's you get marked off every step you take downfield like that. As well as you also are showing whether your band marches well or not. If everybody's wow. not marching uniformly, if you have people not picking their feet up. And you turn them sideways coming downfield, you, you're, you're lowering your score. You understand what I'm saying? You're immediately oh, yeah. lowering your score. <laughs> um, it's more difficult to judge a band coming across field from a, 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 a knee lift standpoint because they're coming straight at you. It's harder to see those flaws as well as it's harder to see line problems, you know, if they are horizontally facing the adjudicator. Mm-hmm. So when planning a show, you have to think about those things um, that can cost. Um, the next thing is, does your music fit your drill? I, I see a lot of people that, that execute their drill, but a lot of the execution doesn't take place on phrase. It's much oh, okay. Easier, yeah, it's much easier to have a band turn on time with nobody being late if they're turning right at the beginning of a new phrase <laughs> as opposed to in the middle of a phrase. Yeah. Um, just And the way to, to, to deal with that is sitting down with your music and your drill and looking at those spots where the music changes and having your major drill change happen at the same spot. They accent each other, and it's easier for a student to move on time when they can know exactly precisely what note they're moving on. And that has to take place in the planning. If it means that you need to mark time with an extra 16 counts in order to get it on phrase, <laughs> then mark time that extra 16 counts. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that, that will improve your overall uh, precision. Uh, and the, and the presentation I, too. Yeah, I mean, I could just see, I could just imagine that, you know, just hitting something, <clears throat> you know, uh, or just anything, just right on the music. It's, not, it kind of, it's like a feeling on the inside you get. You know what I mean? I definitely know exactly Absolutely. what you're saying. Yeah. And once again, it goes back to that thing we talked about: muscle memory. Mm. If you're playing through the song and you've been rehearsing that every time this particular part comes in, we turn and go here. Guess what your body will do automatically when you get to that part? Turn it off. Yeah, hit it That's, too with a little enthusiasm yeah. too, probably. You'll know exactly where it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you a, 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 a inside secret on what I tend to do when I judge. Normally, I'm judging marching and precision. Well, I, I make myself little notes every time a person turns late or early or doesn't stop on time. I make a little line. 
So when I go back to write my score down, I'm looking at these lines, and depending on the score sheet, I've assigned a point amount for every time somebody has stopped wrong or turned wrong or all of that. <laughs> so people lose points constantly. Mm. And it's mainly stuff that could have been cleaned up. But it can be cleaned up by the planning from the beginning of where they're going to move, where they're going to stop, where they're going to turn. You make it much easier on the student if you have already thought that through yourself as opposed to, you know, drill them 18 times and they're going to miss it every time because they don't fully understand where to turn. Wow. So, um, plus, a band that's precise on movement and the turns happen at the same time, the phrasing changes in the music, the general effect points go up. Because it looks clean. Mm-hmm. One accents to other. So it's much cleaner when you have precise movement that fits the music. You never want to hit the climax of a song and you're facing away. Wow. <laughs> you know, when you get to that powerful part of a song, you want to be facing home to hit that particular part of the music. And we need to understand that places like the beginning of, of the chorus or the beginning of the hook of a piece, you want to be facing in a way where you get the full impact of wherever that is in the music. And that has to be planned out. Okay? That's outstanding. Um, outstanding. <laughs> uh, the last part of that in planning is don't plan your band and not plan your auxiliaries. Your auxiliaries and what they do need to be the overall part of what you're doing on the field. Don't just throw your flags out there some way and tell them to do what they're going to do. You frame your band with your auxiliary, flags in particular, and make sure that the movement that they're doing is complementing the movement that the band is doing. General effect deals with everything on the field. So you can't look like you have musicians and a bunch of girls up there doing stuff. It should be the entire band program bringing together an idea of what you've got on the field. Once again, that takes planning. Uh, and a lot more time needs to be spent in planning what you're going to do on the field and have a reason for all of it as opposed to just throwing things out there. Do you okay. like auxiliary? How do you feel about auxiliary itself? Um, and uh, and we are talking about high school marching bands, but do you feel that auxiliary is a necessity at the high school level? Auxiliaries can, let's see, how do I start? Auxiliaries can be, well, let me ask you this way. Do you like steak without seasoning? Oh, man, uh, what? No, I don't think so. Okay. No. So what auxiliary should be is that seasoning on the steak. There can't be the steak. Mm-hmm. But they should accent and and help to bring about what you're trying to accomplish on the field. I love large flag cores, but I only love large flag cores if they can be synchronized and their choreography fits the music. Um, I was never one to throw my flag core out by themselves to do something while the band does something else. Ninety percent of the time, they were on the field with the band. When I taught the drill, I taught them their spots at the same time. Mm-hmm. So that they were a part of what was going on. Now, I never used flags in squads, um, but I used them to frame what the band was doing. Oh, okay, okay, I see what you mean. Okay, um, the uh, now, accent accentation, I guess. Absolutely. Um, I use majorettes uh, more than dancers. Majorettes are using a baton; they're showing a skill. Um. So majorettes, a lot of times now on scorecards, they they do dancers slash majorettes. Because majorette squad, when I say majorettes, I mean girls actually twirling batons, mm-hmm. uh, seems to be going by the wayside. But it's, it takes a skill to learn how to twirl a baton. <laughs> yeah. It takes some discipline to learn how to do that. And I would rather have everybody learning a discipline. 
um, it, it keeps some of the other problems down. Um, if they have something that they have challenging that they have to uh, learn and perfect. Now, the other reason I like auxiliaries, believe it or not, um, probably eight of my ten years at Norcom, 90% of the girls that were in the auxiliary also played an instrument. Wow, really? Yeah. They didn't start by playing an instrument, but this particular time in the spring, we had them come in and learn to play an instrument. And quite often, they would move from auxiliary into the band, so it actually becomes internal recruitment. Wow. It also so, builds, it also builds a concert program because you have more instrumentation. That okay, that was it. So so marching was just marching band, but then in the off season, jazz band, concert band, all those you started having that auxiliary um, showing themselves because I guess I mean it can only make them better out there on the field, you know. Well, they become they become musicians, mm-hmm. so they start to understand phrasing and music and how the music. Wow. Is, what the band's going to do, they can better do what they do because now they understand the music. Um. I always had programs where the concert band had more membership than the marching band did. Always. Um, because we're music educa- educators. So even though someone's twirling the flag, why should they not also get a music education in the process? Right. So that that was my, my philosophy on doing that. And, and it worked tremendously. Yeah, I mean that that that's really cool because I'm sure that it then makes the auxiliary feel good about themselves. Or those people that maybe started on flag and then, um, you know, they play uh, they play an instrument now. I'm sure that their level of confidence changes now. And and who knows? They probably with the accentation and understanding phrases, they maybe understand things that maybe just the basic band student doesn't because they weren't in auxiliary. They were just in you know, in the in the wind. So. Um, that's actually really, really smart. Um, this great other, information here. The other thing that it builds, it builds unity. It builds a yes. respect yes. from one yes. to the other. They don't feel like, you know, we're just auxiliary, so we don't really count, which you find yeah. in a lot of band programs. But if they've become musicians, if they've become really part of that family of, of, of band members, Everything goes better. That's why you should include our members as part of the band and don't push them off to the side to do things. Include them in the overall preparation of the show every day of the week and don't just pull them you know, over there with the band on Wednesday or Thursday and say, okay, now right. we're going to shoot it. Right. <laughs> you know, you don't get unity that way. You know, it's 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 so funny you say that. Um, I don't know if the I don't know how it is at all schools, but I remember when I was at Jackson State, we didn't really get along with the JSS that much. I mean, that's that's kind of up and down a little bit. I'm sure. I mean, everyone knows. Oh, so and so is cool, but just overall, just band it wasn't, yeah. JSS. And, 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 and in many places, it's like that though. Oh, really? With, okay. Yeah, with auxiliary is so seldom with the band that they never really become part. It's, you know, and, and, I, and I'll go further. I've seen some people's drum sections like that. Yeah, and I have seen that because cause you know the drummers. They think, that, you know, they're in their own army and stuff. I have seen that. But, yeah, definitely. But now, so I ask the question, why do they think that? Probably just because, yeah, yeah. They've been allowed to think that. You know, so once again, those are things we have to plan for. You know, is your percussion section in the band room when you teach the music, not just so they can play their part, but they can understand how the music goes. Even if they're not playing on every note. If they're sitting there while you're trying to work the wind parts out, then they get to hear the changes in the music, the nuances between instruments, and they're better able to play and not try to overpower the band because they get a respect for what the band's doing. Yeah. And that shows up on the competition field as well. 
I bet. I mean, yeah. I'm just, it's all the slow stuff is coming into my head now just from that point. And that is very powerful. You definitely want to build that unity. I definitely want to make sure I put that in the chat room. But I'm just thinking about all the times, you know, Jackson State. At Smith, for me, it was different just because, and with all due respect, it was just about 20 or 30 of us all together. That's wins and the auxiliary. So it wasn't like you <laughs> you looked down on flag members when I was at Smith because, I mean, we needed as many people as possible. But definitely when I went to Jackson State, I definitely noticed that difference from the J sets. They would come in to practice on Wednesdays. So they had Monday and Tuesday. They did their own thing. And then when we were on the field Wednesdays, that's when we would put it with them. Same thing with uh, the percussion section. Those Monday nights, we would work on the book. They weren't usually in the band room with us. They how, would get with you, us. Now, now let um, me give you this. How do you develop a groove a lot when you first learn the music if your percussion section is not in there? Boy, you know, I, I, I don't know, but that's how we did it every year when I was there. Sure did. <laughs> we sure did. And we would get with them later. I think... Uh, 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 not Magruder, but, but Mr. Bethea, Mr. William Bethea, I, I believe he's still at Norfolk State. Um, he was the percussion lead there. He would write out the parts. But, yeah, that – just like what you said, that difference in where WT would then start to stick their chest out more than the sonic boom of the South or the J-sets were bigger than the sonic boom of the South. Just what you're saying. But, yeah, we – and then, of course, on Thursday and Friday, it all come together. But you know, um, there's, a, there's a cliche line out of the movie Drumline, but it, it it makes perfect sense. One band, one sound. Wow, that's deep. That, that, that's a, 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 a unity thing. If everybody's out there for the same purpose, if everybody's been received the same training, if everybody shares the same vision, what's done on the field is a much more powerful thing than to have a bunch of sections do it. Wow. It's like a football team. Can you imagine if a football team practiced, but the linemen never practiced with the quarterback? <laughs> the wide receivers never got to see, didn't get a chance on a daily basis to know what the running backs were going to do. What kind of football team would that be? <laughs> we need to think the same way about Ben. We can't let things fragment because those fragmentations cause problems eventually. That's when you start getting drum sex and wanting to go on strike because they didn't get their way. Mm-hmm. That, Dr. Davenport. Yes. This is uh, Rashad over here. Um, so, uh, you know, of course, we had discussed my first question being uh, getting into um, the specifics of how you plan out a show. But this really uh, strikes home with me. And I feel like there's a lot of band directors that are sitting home saying, well, that really sounds good but I don't know how to apply that. Because I, I know one thing, if I had to do my career over again, probably the first thing I would have done was separate them even more. Because, you know, standing in the bedroom, I'm working with these winds, and I'm really big on in, involving in percussion and what's going on. But a lot of times they are they are not having anything to do with what I'm doing right now. And, and they were a major source of distancing problems a lot of times. And I think that many band directors can, can – um, can speak on that. You got everybody in the band room, and you got people that are just sitting around waiting for you to get to them. You know, so how do how in a, on a from a practical standpoint, like in your book, how do you do that? Dealing with the whole band at the same time like that, and still keeping everybody engaged and focused. Okay, and and, this, and right fast is, before you uh, answer that, Doctor Davenport, I'm just letting people know that uh, the the phone lines are open. I'm starting to see a lot of people join this chat room. You are welcome to call in and ask questions. Uh, just uh, similar, so we can keep the conversation going. Okay, go ahead. Well, one thing is, the way you do that from win section to win section, let me start there first. If I had a particular section that I had to go over a part with, everyone in the other sections were required to finger their part. So they stayed engaged, okay? Mm -hmm. And they better understood how their part went against the part that I was working with. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two is you have to teach your percussionist how to read. Mm -hmm. Because if you're writing music and you're writing percussion parts, while you're working with the section of the band, you could have them on pads actually reading their part 
and learning how it goes with what you're working with. It's the same thing. But a lot of times we have percussion sections where the guys can't read. They're just ready to beat on drums. They're not right. even musicians. And because of that, as I said before, we get balance problems because of that. They have no respect for the music. Mm. So you need to teach percussionists how to read. That way, if they're in the band room and you have to stop, you have to work with a particular section, they can be on drum pads playing along, figuring the parts out. Now, of course, sometimes they have to go out and work on cadences and, you know, that kind of thing. But you don't want that to happen all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, that, 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 that works a fragment into the band. And they're not held to the same discipline standard as the rest of the group if you're doing that. Because who's overseeing them while they're out the room? Right. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was thinking. I think it was, it was your point was hit home with me was you said you keeping them engaged. So then Absolutely. they're not back there like, Google, like what's up, dog? Blah, blah, blah. You know, they back mm-hmm. there just like I'm reading my music. They're back there doing they're something. They're reading too. there. Yeah. And that's what should be happening. And like I said, the more time that they're in that room together, hearing what's going on, the tighter the music is. Because everybody understands what everybody else is doing. And that's what you want to happen on the field. Because in the in the confines of the room, everybody can hear what everybody else is doing. We spread them out on the marching field. And unless you know what they're listening for, you've got a problem. A lot of times it shows itself up as a synchronization problem or a balance problem or a control problem because they have not heard everything else that's going on in the band room. So they get out on the field, they don't know what they're listening for. So all they do is listen to themselves. <laughs> we have another. We actually have a caller um, uh, just calling in someone from the 804 area code, someone from Virginia. Um, also, right, fa- right fast, uh, Mario Warren, um, as far as uh, uh, gearing to your question, Rashad, he said that uh, he, he, he believes in having strong section leaders. Says uh, having strong session leaders will help such things. And now more people have joined the chat room. A Warren Shaw said church. So I mean, he preached. Everybody <laughs> here today. Everybody <laughs> preaching out here today. So we got a lot of good activity in the chat room. We really appreciate the support. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get to this caller here for you, Doctor Davenport. Someone from the 804 area code, and you've been holding a while. We really appreciate it. Uh, go ahead and give us your name and where you're calling from. A uh, caller from the 804 area code, are you, are you there? Okay, we may have to, may have a little audio, or if you don't, if you have your mic. That's somebody from, that's somebody from Norfolk State, they just call it in to check out what's going on. <laughs> Ain't nothing <laughs> I'm just calling in. Stop fire. What's going on in here? Yeah, so y'all are going to that one. <laughs> I know. Hey, if if you are for eight oh four, you just call back and represent. Cause hey, you know we just go ahead and keep that one. You you can't roll with Rashad at Norfolk State, man. You know what I'm saying? I had to. Hey, Rashad, I don't know if you noticed, but I couldn't say behold. I didn't want to say behold. We're starting a ninety degree show with this one for you, man. I thought about you on that one, man. I didn't want you to think about no green and gold or nothing like that. that <laughs> Uh, but we'll um, so. we'll go ahead and take this next commercial break, and then we'll let the 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 uh, the phone calls open up, and you guys are free. But we'll continue our conversation here. Um, but again, we thanks uh, the expertise and the great lecture. But we'll hear some more information, I'm sure. But we'll go ahead and hear this uh, last commercial break here. Uh, well, you know what? This the caller called back. Let's see if we can get him on here. Caller from the 804. Can you hear us? Hello, how you doing, caller? Uh, you're on the show with us tonight. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, my name is Bernard Bradley, band director at Kings Fork High School in Suffolk, Virginia. Okay. Hey. My Hampton man. It's all right. <laughs> how you doing, Fred? How you doing? <laughs> all right. How are you doing? One eight nine eight. My question, first of all, good evening to everybody, and my question in particular for Dr. Davenport. Uh, how did you structure your classes? Uh, for myself in particular, this is my second year, well, well this is my first year at a high school band. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking, in particular, we, we talked about the percussion in particular, being able to read. 
uh, I'm thinking about actually separating them into their own percussion class so I can develop those reading skills and those techniques. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Well, I, I know from school to school, you know, you can't always structure your classes like you want to. If you're in a position where you can, um, really set up the way your classes uh, can be. I would have, on a freshman level, ninth grade level, have them separated out. If you can separate into a brass woodwind and percussion class on the ninth grade level, and then have heterogeneous groups as you get to the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Because that ninth grade year is the year you really need to be teaching them to read. You know what I mean? You teach them to read that first year and then start having ensemble classes the sophomore year. Now, of course, that's if you are, you know, allowed to set your classes up that way. Most of the time I wasn't. Most most of my classes were heterogeneous groups, and what I would have to do is, and this takes a lot of management in class, is have days where I would give an assignment. All of my classes were in technique books every year of high school, uh, give an assignment to the wind players and send them to practice a particular issue or exercise and then take that time to get over to the percussion and work them through reading things. Uh, and it has to be done in the same classroom. You know, sometimes they want to throw all our kids in the same class anyway. Uh, <laughs> but depending on how it's set up, you, there's a way to get it done. Uh, but if you have great classroom management where you can really send your kids to practice individually and pull your percussion out, you can do it that way. But I applaud you if you can pull them out, particularly in the ninth grade, into an individual class. That would, that's great because that gives you a chance to make sure that all your ninth graders coming in get to have the same reading level by the time they go to the tenth grade. All right. Well, thank you for that. And I just want to also point out, uh, I actually end up purchasing the book a little earlier from Amazon. Okay. But uh, I've got a lot of great tips, and it has definitely been a help so far this year and going into my recruitment for next year. So, again, well, thank I, you for that. I actually, I think I saw your group this fall. And you're doing an excellent job over there. Keep up the work. Good work. Yeah, we appreciate you calling in. I got your number here, so y'all probably hear from you, you know, just to just to touch base with you about, you know, contacting the network and just love to make sure that you, we support you as well. So thanks for calling in, and uh, we'll be in contact you here at the Marching Podcast Network. And email me if you need. Email. Look, you're your you're homeboy, so email me if you, if if I can ever ask a question for you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I'll be down there right. sometime soon, as a matter of fact. <laughs> That's really cool. We actually got another caller, and uh, we'll go ahead and put this caller in. We'll answer this call. We'll do our last commercial break, uh, and then we'll have the last little onslaught uh, to close out the show and take any more calls if we have. Someone from the Detroit area, I think 313, correct? Uh, someone from the 313 area, go ahead and give us your name. Where are you calling from this evening? Class. Hello? Yeah. You're on the air. How you doing? This is Mario Warren. Oh, what's up? <laughs> Mario. What's up, man? Mario. <laughs> I'm doing good, man. I just wanted to say that, uh, Mr. Davenport, you are a wonderful teacher, man. It's, you led us to a great band program, me and Newsom. I think it's a little unfair because we both sat in this man's class and get a chance to dominate these other high schools <laughs> for what he uh, <laughs> taught us. In his class, and it's just ironic, uh, I guess, because he prepared us so good to be a band director um, from inventory to writing drills. He gave us a fake budget, made us go through it. He actually made us go through an interview for a fake job, and we had to get dressed up and go in. So I wow. applaud all his methods. He's a, a walking treasure trove of information. So I had to, I saw it, I had to call and, uh, Give him his props. His prop, I mean, he's just pedigree. Well, well, look, man, you 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 made me very proud. Uh, what you've done out there, man, I I really applaud you, and uh, I knew that was going to come out of you. So, um, you know, I think the last time we had a face to face conversation was up in the, up in Detroit, River Rouge. Up in, yeah, uh, in River Rouge. Yeah, and um, believe it or not, you're the one that made me write a book. Of <laughs> course, you told me that you had kept the information from class. I was like, well, if it's helping him that much, I need to go ahead and write a book. That's cool. So That's we can cool. help other people. 
Yeah, it's, so, it's, uh, it's wonderful, man. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate it, man. I hope I hope I get a chance to see you sometime soon. All right. If you ever need me, All right, you can call me. Uh, I got you. Okay. Hey man, I'll definitely be uh definitely hitting you up. I really appreciate uh your time and um you the the great Whitehaven school. So I'll definitely be hitting you up here as well. Um, because I know Whitehaven, I actually have a friend that marched in the band with me, Ollie Liddell. Uh Dr. Liddell's okay. son, I believe, is somewhere there in Memphis uh as a band yeah, director Ollie, or something. Good friend. Good friend. Okay, well, okay, well, well great. Mario, you do need to call me soon because I got some info for to share with you as well. Uh, okay, I will do that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, man. We're gonna go ahead and do our last commercial break, uh, and then we'll uh, go ahead and close. And anyone else has any more calls, uh, any more questions, you're free to do so with the 2014 Director Series, preparing for co- competition with Dr. Davenport here in the Marching Podcast Network, and sponsored to you by the Great Block Band Music and Publishing. This is David Thompson, owner and founder of Liquid Effects Photography, and you're listening to the 90 Degree Show here on the Marching Podcast Network. Need to write music and drill? Get it on the field. I'll fix your fan, keep your administrator happy, and still have a life. Encountering drama in the process, ain't nobody got time for that. Let Rock Band Music assist you with musical arrangements and drills to fit your band, and also the equipment, gear, and accessories to keep the visuals, music, and marching on point. Contact Rock Band Music at gmail.com and see how this worldwide minority-owned business can uplift your band. Having an anniversary party, birthday party, or better yet, you're about to marry that special someone? Liquid Effects Photography is the perfect choice to immortalize all your most special moments. With 10 years of dependable professional service that can deliver from the conventional to the best in cutting-edge technology and creativity. Come experience the uniqueness of Liquid Effects Photography. We serve the entire upper Midwest and will travel further upon request. Come check us out at liquideffects.com. That's L-I-Q-U-I-D-E-F-F-E-X.com. Or call us at 773-454-5556. That's 773-454-5556. Hey, this is John Pickens, CEO and founder of Simply Dope Creative, and you're listening to the 90 Degree Show here on the Marching Podcast Network. Okay, we're back in our last block here and uh we want to give uh I want to give you Dr. Davenport some time to um talk about your book again uh so people are aware about your book um um again I posted the information in our chat room but just uh could you just give us some information just to let us know where we can get that book uh Rashad I'm going to let you go in and um if you have anything else to say um you're also free to call in if you want at 718-664-6025 before we close out the show um, and we got about six minutes or so. Um, so, Dr. Davenport, could you give us the information so we could run out and grab your book as well? Well, once again, the name of the book is Practical Techniques for Building a High School Marching Band. And um, I'm so glad that Warren, uh, Mr. Warren was on the line. Uh, what I've attempted to do in the book, not to try to tell anybody how to run the program, but to give people things they need to consider when they're building one, all the way from having a vision um, and a philosophy for what they're doing to the proper setup of a band program overall to really how to buy instruments, how to buy and take care of uniforms, how to build a band parents organization, how to develop relationships with administration in your building, the importance of that. So I touch on a lot of different topics uh, of things that normally we don't get in music education courses. Um, I am in the process of working on a part two for the book. Uh, but you can get it online, um, most of you know Amazon and other sites like that. But I encourage you to get it through Block Band Music. If you buy the book through Block Band Music, um, you get an extra benefit. Of course, you get an autograph the book, but you also get a email and a phone number. So for a year, you actually get free consultation directly from me 
You'll be able to call me or email me anytime, and um, I will work with you, build your, helping you build your program uh, for the next year or so. So I hope you go out and get it, and hope you'll give me comments of, of how you like it. Please check out my website at drkdavenport.wix.com slash my site, and um, please get in touch with me. We really appreciate that. I just want to give uh, the highlight points right quick, and I'm going to give it to you, Rashad, so you can say your uh, parting shots out. Um, we just gave uh, – Dr. Davenport gave four pillars for, as far as practical te- – I'm sorry, not practical techniques. That's the name of the book. But four pillars as far as uh, your pr- pr- uh, preparation. Um, remember that this is a music educational activity. Uh, number two, that this is an exercise in discipline and precision. Uh, Number three is that you're building towards excellence. And number four, that your preparation begins in band camp and make sure to teach what you want to your band so that it's a part of them. Um, And actually planning your show, you want to make sure you pick the right music. Uh, Number two, you want to be careful of doing shows downfield and coming in from the end zone. Um, And uh, your placements of your instruments, uh, be aware of that. Uh, And does your music fit your drill? As we talked about patterns of motion, uh, patterns of motion being parallel with the phrasing. And uh, he talks about uh, number four, don't forget about your auxiliary in your show. Uh, Unity is very important. One band, one sound. Um, Those things are very, very crucial, and again, if you want some more in-depth, you can contact the show. You contact Block Band Music. Really sounds like an unbelievable deal with Block Band Music getting the book through him, so then you can get that support. So we definitely suggest you do that, Rashad. uh, The man, um, go ahead. uh, Please give us uh, some of your parting shots. we got about three minutes, but um, anything else that we want to know about Block Band Music um, and anything else that you're doing for foreclosing? I'm going to take about 30 seconds to pop us and then see if I can get Dr. Davenport to answer one thing real quick. So, um, okay. everyone, Block Band Music and Publishing is a company that is owned and run by graduates of HBCUs, okay? And we provide, as you've heard, music. We provide drill. Uh, we provide all your equipment, your spats, your shoes, your gloves, your mouthpieces, your drumsticks, your reeds, your drum heads, your mouths, your drum major batons. We do concert band music, pretty much everything that you might need. And our goal is we are here to help kickstart the revolution of show style band right now. Um, not only are we trying to provide a source for you to get everything that you need as a real company, a dependable company, but also we're networking with others such as yourself, Joe, and Dr. Davenport. That's my dryer, y'all. Sorry about that. (laughs) 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 But we're networking with others in order to – in order to really come together to take this thing to the next platform. Show style band is so important. It's an incredible art form, and we've got to protect it, y'all. I hope that everyone else out there will, will support us. We ask you that you support us. If you've got other companies that you work with already, just check us out and see if you can get the same thing at the same price. We ask you that you support us because we really want to support you. And that's Block Band. Uh, Block Band Music and Publishing, at, uh, I mean, Block Band music.com or email us at uh, blockband at gmail.com blockbandmusic at gmail.com alright real quick Dr. Davenport um, so when, when we first met the number one thing that really blew my mind as far as preparing for competitions you said um, you would take each squad and work it out there uh, individually can you talk about that real quick well I, uh, in, in building discipline and precision um, all of my squads knew exactly what they were supposed to do, and I, I challenged them to take it upon themselves to have enough pride to make sure they did their parts properly. So they would go on the bill individually and go through their entire show. They did their before band rehearsal, sometimes they after band rehearsal, to make sure they cleaned up what they had to do. It became a personal responsibility to do what they needed to do. And, and that kind of personal responsibility shows in the overall show when they approach the band that way. Have your band students take ownership of what is going on, and you'll have a much easier job of what you do. 
That's outstanding, Dr. Davenport. Uh, we will be back on the third Sunday of next month in June with our second part of this series, and we'll recap. We'll spend the uh, spend the first couple minutes or so of the next show recapping the things that we talked about. Uh, just to reiterate some things, this is a really good show, and I could talk about these points over and over again. But again, Dr. Davenport, uh, to Rashad, this is an outstanding idea, Rashad. Way to go. Uh, thanks. I'm really excited about you. Uh, thanks to you for all the people listening. Uh, we'll be back next week. Check us out this week for Chopping It Up. We want to thank you for always listening. And remember, the eyes of everyone's blood will be within the team.